Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming by. A lot of people. Fuck. <laughs> Thank you for coming by. Uh, yeah, let's go. Uh, my name is Tony, and this is sort of a follow-up from the talk from the last year, but it's also a second chance to fix the messed up talk that I did last the, the other day. And yeah, on that talk of the last year, I discussed about how to kill uh, 3D in your, in your animations, and I also announced that I was working on a personal project where I'm trying to apply all these tiny tricks that I've learned to uh, reach a 2D look with, with 3D tools. And today, finally, it works. It doesn't work. <laughs> oh my god. Well, today with partial videos, I can finally bring you a finished project and break it down and show you people how I fought the NPR in Cannibal Valley. And yeah, this is technically my, I, let's go to the next one. Uh, this is technically my, my demo reel from Bebe School Land, Daniel Martinez Lara Animation School in, based in Barcelona. And as other former students, I wanted to make a short film, and Danny gave me the space to do it, as always. Uh, but the thing is that at that time, I didn't know what to do. I didn't have a script or an idea. All I, wa all I knew was going to be a, a NPR animated production. And it was Nacho Maure here, who's present here today, that introduced me to this comic book uh, saga called Solo. Solo is made by Oscar Martin, uh, and it's been published since the 90s, so this is officially a, a fan film. And yeah, um, let's go to the point. Um, in 2D animation, uh, modeling, rigging, texturing, shading, animating, all it goes through uh, the hands of a single artist, the 2D animator. Not just one single artist, but you get what I mean. While in 3D, these all these tasks are divided in between several artists and several departments. And I think this is the biggest handicap of this kind of productions because if the pipeline doesn't have a clear direction or yeah, stick to the traditional production methods, you will end up with results that with all due respect. This is a video. Magic hand, good play. This is gonna be tough. Okay, you would end up with results that, with all due respect, uh, creates a new kind of uncanny valley that it looks 2D, but it's not. And this is maybe that something that you're looking for, but I bet that part of the audience will be struggling and trying to not stab their eyes, myself included. So how do we get all these artists on the same page? And how do we, can we go by? Uh, how we um, avoid the NPR Uncanny Valley in animated productions. And that's what I try to explore with, with this project. Uh, I, don't, I will try not to repeat a lot of things that I talked on the last year talk, uh, but let's summarize just for being, have a little bit of context. This is another video. There will be another video. Uh, we will work a lot together today. <laughs> uh, NPR is uh, not necessarily trying to fake 2D. NPR stands for non-photorealistic rendering, so it can involve a lot of styles from anime, pixel art, and even low-poly style like 64-bit era, right? So this is not necessarily make the, the 2D thing, but in, the, in my case, I, I choose the path of faking Faking 2D, and this is because, and this is all about that 3D is precise and perfect by default, and it's the opposite thing from, from 2D. Uh, this precision in 2D comes to a high cost for the artist, and that's why 2D productions start to incorporate 3D tools on their productions, right, to, to, save, to save work and, and money. But paradoxically, next video, did that one. Paradoxically, when you let the machine do the work for you, it automatically kills the 2D effect. 
because 2D is spontaneous and it's defined by their own limitations and without those hints of limitations, uh, the trick is revealed, it's, it's made in 3D. I like to think it about like, next, next video. Uh, I like to think it about like making stop motion with 3D tools. It's true that there are a lot of high detail and good stop motion productions, but this uh, technique has certain flows that in popular culture are accept, commonly accepted as part of the medium. For example, uh, the cloth of a character or the hair may shake a bit because a human hand has been involved to change in the pose. And the next video, uh, the funny thing is that if you are doing, um, I pass it. I pass the slide, and you play the video. <laughs> yeah. If you are doing a stop motion with a 3D software, uh, you don't need uh, to deal with these issues, right? Because there's no human hand involved in making all these errors. However, it's when you add those errors that it starts evoking the stop motion feeling. So the same thing goes with 2D, faking 2D. You need to add those certain errors to get closer to the medium that you are trying to simulate. So, um, yeah, and this is not something, let's go to the next one. And this is uh, something uh, that I, uh, I like to call it the, a 2D input. Uh, you have to generate this, this 2D input to trick the brain, but it's not something. Uh, what's going on? It's not something that um, it's. Sorry, it was only a fancy shader thing. It's because it involves almost all departments in the production, and those departments will need to produce um, this to the input by their own to contribute uh, to the whole production and make a huge fucking lie who confuse the audience and make the trick done. It's something common in filmmaking, right? It's all about illusion. So this is not something about making, this is a video too, not making an arcane style well, three, when, where 3D is so obvious, but doesn't matter at all because it looks awesome. This is more, next slide. Uh, this is more about uh, simulating um, traditional cell animation with 3D tools, kind of maybe something like that. So with this talk, I want to uh, talk about this um, guiding principles that help me with, uh, um, along the production to deal with how do I generate those to the inputs. And the first one, and the most important, I think, is don't move your camera. I think more of the problems with Uncanny Valley in this kind of productions, play, please. Uh, becomes with uh, moving, moving your camera. It's something that in 3D it's almost for free, but in 2D, um, yeah, it's something that is more difficult and the animator have a struggle. If you can pass to the next one, uh, that we commonly see in in 2D, another kind of solutions, creative solutions to the with, with these camera movements. And in the first place, you will need to understand how a 2D animator has solved this problem, and then you have to translate this. But first of all, if you can, just don't move the camera. Next one. Uh, got it? Yeah. Second one, embrace the dead pixel. Uh, back in the days, uh, this is a video. Japanese animation shaped the industry by reducing cost, uh, solving a whole acting thing. Uh, solving an acting, just moving the, char the character's mouth, or even moving away the camera and having a conversation at 20 meters from our, from our characters. And in 3D productions, uh, 3D animation, we tend to animate everything because dead pixels uh, look uh, unnatural, but even high detail 2D productions have these resting moments because we don't want dead animators. So uh, we have to look for those resting moments to convey that a 2D animator has been involved in the, in the process. Next one. 
The next uh, principle is flat shading. I bet most of you know what's going to happen with the rock of the background of this, of this shot. And this is a video. And yeah, um, animated assets. Will you play, play please? Uh, animated assets uh, have um, simpler line work and color work, just for obvious reason, because it's, it's cheaper. So this is something like the stop motion example, right? You don't need to deal with these issues in 3D because you have your high detailed asset and you can put it on everywhere. But if you start to make these certain errors, add these certain errors in your production, you start evoking uh, the, the 2D deception, right? Next one. Uh, we pass it. Yeah. Bad cleanup. By bad cleanup, Ready for the video? Um, by bad cleanup, what I mean is add uh, the, pre the presence of vibration and inconsistencies on the, on the drawing uh, to convey the hand was been struggling to maintain all volumes. And yeah, when 2D tries to be so precise, it's something similar to make something 3D. You are trying to reach uh, a certain perfection and I want to go to the opposite way. I want to go as rough as possible. It might feel bad, but it will less 3D, for sure. And last but not least, leave room for handmade solutions. Um, especially in 3D, especially in rigging, on some faces, we tend to complicate our character setup with constraints, mesh the forms, and that even can just press play. Uh, that can prevent us even from sculpting a shape cake at the, at the end of the process because of the complexity of our setup. So th just think that sometimes, just sometimes, um, it's easier to fix things later, even over painting things and make your life easier because if not, uh, it will be some a setup very complicated and may, maybe you are and asking why didn't I learn to the animation in the first place and put end to this suffering, right? <laughs> so let's see how these principles, there are more, but I think it's the main one, are applied into, oh, let's move. Are applied in one of uh, our shots. This shot is made by Alan Caravantes, uh, the animator and also former student from Pepe School. And he helped me not only giving me the opportunity to work with high quality animations, but also he support me in every aspect of the project. So, Alan, if you're there, thank you so much. So yeah, uh, having a conversation around here, uh, we talked about the importance of the animatics. It's something that I don't put on the on the on my presentation, but just. A little bit. Um, animatics is so important. You need to make a really good to the animatic and try to uh, translate this in, in 3D. I will start with with the face of layout, but before that, it's better to have a, a 2D animatic very very polite. And then don't move the camera and layout face um, because what I said before that camera it's uh, almost free in 3D and. It's the opposite thing on, on 2D. Uh, this project doesn't have, play the video please, uh, doesn't have 3D camera animations. Every shot was rendered with a still camera and then all these camera movements were uh, made later in, in post-production. And the uh, camera was only animated to practical reframings and once it gets the new point of view, it remains still again. And then all these uh, camera shakes, handheld, and something were made afterwards in, in post-production, as you can see in, in this slide. Next one, please. <clears throat> yeah, for the layout thing, I had a, a first a conversation with Alan uh, and talk about how this camera was gonna, gonna be worked later in post-production and then Alan, with this, this is a video, please. You wanna work a lot today. Um, once this conversation was done, he starts animating, keeping things in mind, what we talked, and then he starts animating the camera as he needs. 
And later on, I came into and made a 2D camera, uh, preventing all, all these uh, camera solutions that we're going to make later on on, on post-production. Next one is also a video. I want to uh, remind that there's a difference between moving and rotating the camera. Rotating the camera doesn't generate parallax between objects, so it's very, very convenient for us. But moving the camera is when every object starts overlaying each other in a perfect way. So again, don't move the camera, but rotate the camera. Yeah, it's going to be something that you can do. Next one, it's also a video again. Um, this is another example of another shot made by, by Alan when we decided to not move the camera and make the background uh, make, uh, feel the, the movement of the feeling of movement. And even you can see it, the character getting closer to the camera instead of the camera moving to the character is more something more similar to the handicap that a 2D animator has than, than a 3D animator. And then the backgrounds are illustration that you can pan and give the sense of, of movement again. Next one, animated, uh, embrace the dead pixel. Uh, as I said before, we try to, in free animation, you tend to animate everything, but sometimes it's not something intentional. Next one, it's a video. Uh, simply, our rig has interconnected bones and can't provoke uh, involuntary movements that we don't want. Please play, please. And yeah, for that, uh, we even force the dead pixel to, to convey that uh, to the animator has saved some work in not redrawing certain areas of our character. Uh, next one, another thing that I try to, to work on, I ask the animators, uh, it's not having a smooth progression between poses, right? We are going from front uh, profile to frontal, back to profile with the less information in between, just a subtle variation of the same pose. And that uh, can, uh, yeah, this is what, because our supposed to the animators have uh, saved work in that between and give us a closer approach to the, to the mini medium. And our frame rate wasn't fixed. Uh, we go on twos and then on fours, even eights if it's necessary. And that, uh, not a lot of information of, of animation give us a, a 2D feeling stronger. Uh, this is another video. Uh, and for being able to break the character with nearest mid frames and can pose to the camera, <laughs> I asked for a rig as flexible as possible, uh, being able to move every controller just to uh, make a manual work. This is not something like handmade solutions, but kind of to, from camera, uh, redraw with uh, posing our character as, as, we, as we want. Okay, next one. Uh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. I'm going back. No, wait, ya está. No. Flat shading is uh, another one. Uh, Remembering the, the slide of Dragon Ball rocks on the background, uh, I, want, I wanted to go with a really, really flat shader, just with a, one level of, of shadow maximum. And despite in 2D productions, play the video, please. Uh, despite in 2D productions, uh, you try to go simpler with your line work. My decision here was to go uh, in a heavy pencil look, just uh, finding a, a rough uh, sensation and yeah, not trying to go with a, a good cleanup. We will go with a bad cleanup, which we'll talk later. And that um, yeah, allowed me not to worry about uh, consistency. It's something the opposite, just to the, to the opposite way. Next one, it's another video. Uh, in color, despite there are shadows in this project, no 3D lighting has been used. Uh, what I did was using uh, the, the normals from the shader, and despite I don't have trace, traced shadows, I can control where the shadow will be in every frame and not let the machine do the work for me. 
Next one. Bad cleanup. This process come after the animation was done and before the render starts. It's a funny thing because in 2D we have a rough animation that needs to be polished and clean. And in this case I had 3D animations polished and perfect that I need to, to break up. And for that uh, video, uh, what I did was using shaders, um, okay. shaders, geometry nodes, and modifiers, and to give all these variations that I'm talking about. But despite all these parameters are in different places and different locations away from each other, what I did to not die in the process, next one, it's a video. What I did was to concentrate all these parameters through the character's root bone. In that way, I can control it, everything on one place. And also, and more important, I can control it on the same action as my character. And then all I need to do was to go to new, every new pose and add variation. But this was a manual work to do. So here's where a wonderful friend of mine, Jordi Rosa, Help me developing a tool that basically looks for a bone reference which animated and translate all these keyframes on my root bone in the parameter that I'm that I want to. So this sped up the process very very much. Next one. Uh, yeah, the character render was uh, made with a color pass and a line work pass. And that allowed me to treat the, the layers more in a similar way at cell animation. And the problem is that changing from color to line work, it doesn't only involve to, to change the shader. It also means hiding or unhiding modifiers and geometry nodes and stuff. So um, again, what I did, next one. What I did again, next one was to drive all these parameters. Yeah, video. All these parameters in a custom property of an empty, what I call the switch. And in this switch, I can, again, uh, change the shader, modifiers, and everything in one single place. The thing, there's still more manual work to do, because when the scene is more complex and there are a lot of characters and a lot of switches, uh, here's where, again, Jordi Rosa helped me developing another tool where we, we can change all these parameters in one place and also group all the switches from the scene and change it in all characters at once at, at, the, same, at the same time. And even this tool was used to render. No? You click render and then first make a, a line word pass, which saved in the shots folder, and then another one for the, for the color pass. And with the render done, we jump to the next phase, which was 2D fixing, the handmade, the handmade so solutions. Uh, this, is, this process was to play, the, was to fix all these things that 3D couldn't reach. So this is more about UV and conventional 3D fixing things in every shot. But yeah, most of all was the the overpainting, the overpainting phase. You have to make your life easier, and and when you have a solid base on of your render, for me it was easier to just follow the line and pushing the this delighted look when 3D doesn't reach. Even for example, hands where. Hands in NPR animation productions is, are a clear giveaway of, of 3D. So my choice here was to deal with overpainting. And yeah, in the money shots were a little bit more complex because of subtle camera movements that make me draw almost every frame. But, but it was a work for an artist. It was not a really complex process. And for that, what I did uh, was simply a new scene with my render layers and you know, color with line work overlaying above. And right in the middle, I put a grease pencil object to, to fix this 3D, 3D errors. Next one. Yeah, for 2D VFX, I 
especially wanted to them to be into the I here I've been honored to be held with by Emmanuel Espinosa to the animator also from Barcelona and yeah the only 3d effects that because 2d effects will be uh, head to the to the uh, deception the only 3d effects that was been used were um, the dust ambient from the background which was a geometry note that i that i made with a flat edge shader and a mountain trail shader job that i made which was a plane attached to the camera for for motion blur purposes and next one yeah with all this work done we can jump to the final stage which was compositing i would like to say that this process was made entirely in blender but unfortunately this 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 phase was made in in after effects because of time and amount of work to to deal with but basically the, this this phase was to make the camera movement that i talked about earlier but also integrate our characters with the background and working on the on the final look i was looking for a more oppressive and volumetric ambient like a lot of dust uh, volumetric shadows and god ray lighting thing and also <coughs> next one and also um I was not interested in HD results. I again, I like in pencil. This is a video. Again, uh, as in pencil look, where I try to go like more of VHS thing, like really analogic. Using for that, I use chromatic aberration, uh, grain, color bleeding too. And yeah, not to go in on the finest final looks, you know more of yeah kind of a and this old television thing right with a lot of of grain and and certain errors and yeah i don't know if i rust but this is pr pretty much everything i i would like to to go in deep in more processes but uh yeah time is it i ah, know it's another one for the focusing thing some people suggest me to use chromatic aberration as this is spider best thing, no? Use chromatic aberration for the focus layers, but I wanted to try with blurring and the focusing things as this reminds me to the Disney's multiplane camera, right? It's something that evokes a certain period of to the animation. So I, I wanted to to go for it. And yeah, I think this is this is already it. I want to finish the talk, not only thanking all these people that helped me to reach this project from the ground but also i want to have some words about yesterday because i didn't I jump in here like, i don't want to say but yeah i have something to say that thanks to to all these people thanks to oscar the author of the original work that since i showed him what i was working on he offered to help in whatever is needed and I also want to thank Blender because the, they give me all the tools and since that I start, I feel that it was a software who cares about that small artists could make great things. So just for that, thanks a lot. And I, f I hope that you find something useful on, on this presentation and maybe the next time that you want to start a, a production if maybe if you are a studio or a small artist those guidelines maybe could help you deal to deal with with this kind of uncanny valley npr thing thank you so much